Hey everybody, we're back for the second half of week two material. I'm looking at graphs, um, talking about graphs that enlighten and graphs that deceive. A lot of that has to do with what we discussed about that psychological effect in statistics and graphs taking advantage of that psychological effect to make you perceive the data in a way that's not necessarily true. Now, before we get too far into that, I do want to step back and look at some of the graphs we've done before. Um, we looked at histograms before making tables of our data. So I want to, first of all, make a table here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this set of data here. Um, to make the frequency table, we need to find what is the minimum value. Well, the minimum value up here looks to be 4.8, 4.7, it looks like. And the maximum value, oops, I didn't get my seven in there. The maximum value is the largest value, and that looks to be 6.7. So I need to have ranges that go from 4.7 to 6.7. So that's a range of 2.0. Uh, if I want five or six classes in there, um, it looks like we can, let's just go with classes that are convenient here. So let's do 4.5 to 4.9. 0 0.0 to 5.4, 5 5.5 5 .5 to 5.9, 6.0 to, to 6.4, and we do have to do 6.5 to 6.9. Now you'll notice I put the second number in its own column. If you recall, that's from that histogram function. Uh, if we look at our data menu here, Controls out of the way, recording controls out of the way. So we go in our data menu. We have data analysis. We click on that. One of our tools in that data analysis tool pack is a histogram function. And we select that histogram function. It'll bring up a window asking us to input. So we're going to input the data range. I'm going to click here and just drag. That's my data. My bin range. That's why put these in a separate column. I need the upper class limit for each bin. Um, no labels. If I click labels, remember it'll, it'll ignore the top row there. I don't want that. My output range, I'm just gonna click right here to have it output there. And I'm not going to do a chart output right now. I'm just gonna make the table. So there is my frequency table. Now we would probably change that to be a little more accurate so that we have our class and our frequency. And for the class, I would type out now 4.5 to 4.9 with a frequency of five using the numbers that I got from that histogram function, 5.0 to 5.4. But you, know, you see that obviously in the bins, I only have the upper class limit I really prefer to have both the upper and lower class limit in there so that I get an idea of what the range of each class is. So then finally 6.5 to 6.9 and there's a frequency of one there. So now that I have this frequency table made, I can highlight it and I can go to insert. To make a histogram, we, I, we could use the histogram function I'm not a big fan of the histogram function in Excel. Instead, I just make a simple column chart. So I get my column chart right there. You can see that turns out pretty well, um, but it's not really a histogram yet because remember a histogram, there was no space between the bars. So what we need to do is right click on one of the bars and select format data series. Now we have some options over here, and I'm just going to set this gap, uh, gap width, drag that down to zero. You know, it's now my bars are tight together. So now it is a histogram. I could change my title and stuff up here as I need to, but there is my histogram. Other data we talked about, um, we talked about bar graphs. So here is our, this is a list of college students and what, School, what area they are in, whether they're a liberal arts major, a business major, engineering major, or art major. Let's say those are the four main divisions that our school has. If we highlight them, we can click insert. 
And this would also be a column graph, makes a nice bar graph, and there it is. Now if I want to make a Pareto chart, now this one just happened to be already ordered, then what I can do is I can actually order the data. I can do this, I can go to data and sort. Now there's two columns there, I mean, it's sorted by the first column. Now if I click this way and drag, it should sort it by the second column. Well, I don't want it sorted A to Z. I don't want it smallest to largest. I want it Z to A, largest to smallest. So I click that, it sorts them largest to smallest. So this would now be a Pareto chart because the highest frequency is first and the lowest frequency is last. Another chart we might want to make off of this or graph would be a pie graph or pie chart. So again, we highlight the data and click insert, and there's a pie chart option. And we just click a normal pie chart, and there it is. Um, we can make a lot of changes here, format our data series, um, which is something I want, add data labels, and give us options to see it puts the frequency in there. We could also get it so it changes, so it puts the liberal arts in the, the pie slice rather than off in a legend. All sorts of different uh, options we can choose. And then, of course, within that, we can choose different options of a pie chart. We don't want any expanded out or anything like that. Other types of plots that we're going to look at is time series plot. So all these have been um, perspective or snapshots. Data taken at a single moment in time. Um, And, and so it's one variable, one item measured several samples of that item, several uh, occurrences of that item at one moment in time. Here we're tracking one variable, one measurement over time. So in this example, we're going to get the price of gas by year. Um, so I am going to highlight it, and we're going to make, a, let's call it a line graph for this one. So I select line graph. Now here it's going to try to give me two different lines. That's not what I want. So I have two options. I can either delete it and back out, um, or I can try to format my data series again. I click select data. And what I don't want series one graphed. I want series two to be graphed. And I want my horizontal categories to be the, these numbers right here. And there we get, you can see it changes our graph now, it's better. My years are along the bottom, and I have my numbers down through there. Um, let's see, something went wrong. Let me, uh, I want to delete that out. I believe I highlighted the top number, and the line graph does not allow us to do labels. So let's redo that. So we're going to click Insert, Line Graph, Generic Line Graph, and we'll change the, the chart data. So we want to unselect that, and we want to select these as my inputs. There we go. Now things look to be lined up better. Oops, hit cancel. If you accidentally hit cancel, it undoes what you've just done, so we got to redo it quick. So hit OK, and OK, and there it is. So the years now line up. And we mentioned with a line graph, um, you know, the slope of the line tells us whether increasing or decreasing and how fast. So it's a very useful plot for showing changes over time. So back to the presentation here. So our key concepts we're looking at in this section, we're making the graphs, of course, but then things that can be done when you make the graphs that can cause them to be deceiving. So things we should avoid. Um, we have the technology to do all sorts of different things. We saw Excel here to create the graphs, um, but we can do adjusting scales, adjusting axes, and stuff like that. Um, we want to be careful doing those things. And that's the main point of this section is what things we can do to make the graphs easier to read and what things we should avoid that might make the data a little misleading. So when we look at dot plots, um, a dot plot is a very simple plot. It just shows the value stacked up. Like here, the value of 60, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dots above it, which tells us 60 occurred seven times in that set of data. 
The more dots that are above that number, the more often it occurred. Dot plot is really useful because if we trace through the top dots, it gives us a shape of the distribution of the data. And we've mentioned that a little bit. Um, we're looking for that bell shape. When we talk in, in unit three about numerical descriptions of data, that shape from the dot plot is going to be very important. Here we can see it's not a perfect bell shape. It's what we call skewed, stretched out in one direction. But that is a very, uh, very reliable plot. There's very little way to make the dot plot deceiving. It's just what it is. It shows the dot very well. Um, the only problem is it's not a real pretty plot. So it displays the shape of the distribution and it's really, um, you can actually recreate the actual data from it. I can go through and see, well, this is what, 61, 2, 3, must go up by twos or so, 62, 4, 6, 66. I can count how many dots there, and I can see how many 66s there were in that data set. So I can actually reconstruct the exact data set from that dot plot, which is great. So stem and leaf plots, um, we've seen these as well. Uh, we have the stem here. In most cases, a stem and leaf plot represents a two-digit number. So here we have the four, stands for 40. The zero stands for 40. The two stands for 42. So the stem is our tens digit. The leaf over here is the ones digit. So this is 50, or five for 50. This means a 50, a 50, a 52, another 52, on up. So down here, this 10 would be 100. This is 102, 104. Again, it represents the exact numbers. We show the shape of the data as well, just like with the dot plot, except it's set on its side. We can sketch how far the list of numbers goes out and we can get that kind of shape of the data, kind of that bell shape, it just tilted on its side. And also, we can again, we have all the original values, we could reconstruct the data values. And it puts them in order, making sure we put these numbers in order in each row as well, I'm putting those leaves in order. We can use this as a tool to find uh, medians and, and to divide up our data if we want to. Time series graph, the line plot. Um, the line plot is great because it, you can see the slopes. You know, sloping up means the value is increasing. Sloping down means decreasing. The steepness of it shows how rapidly it's increasing or decreasing. The weakness of the line plot, it reveals the trends, but it does not reveal exact numbers. If I wanted to look here at this date and tried to tra trace that over here from here, well, I can see that's just a little below 240, but I don't know, is that 237, 238? Um, I can't get exact values from this. Uh, in most graphs, getting exact values is a little tough. The plots, you know, the stem and leaf plot and the dot plot, those are plots, not graphs. Um, so we can get exact values out of those. But for a, a, a line plot like this, we would have to go back to the original table that was used to construct the plot in order to get those exact values. The bar graphs, um, again, it's the categorical version or the qualitative data. Uh, we saw how the bar graph is constructed back here. Here was our bar graph. I didn't change the title. college major or major field of study. Um, again, it's very quick to look at the bar graph and say which one is the most frequent, which one's the least frequent, with the tallest bar being the most frequent, shortest bar being the least frequent. But once again, it's hard to get an exact value. Like here for the business majors, we trace that over. We can see it's between 30 and 35, but is that a 31 or a 32? We really don't know for sure. So getting exact values off of that, again, is a little bit tricky. We can, again, see the relative shape of the distribution. Now, for 
a bar graph, the categorical data, um, there isn't a logical order of the, the values, so the shape really is meaningless. That would be more for the histogram um, where we have numerical categories rather than categorical or qualitative categories. The Pareto chart, well, this actually, we turned this into a Pareto chart. That just means we put the data in order from highest frequency to smallest frequency. So we get that kind of downward sloping um, set of bars. So again, it shows, rather than showing the absolute frequency, the Pareto chart technically shows the relative frequency. So I should have changed these into relative frequencies by dividing by the total. Um, but it would be the exact same shape. The bars are going to be the exact same shape. It just changes the scale of the graph a little bit. And by putting the higher frequency first, you can see it draws more attention to that higher frequency um, categories. In this case, pilot error is the main reason for fatal plane crashes. These, by the way, just so you know, are talking about small aircraft, not commercial aircraft. Pie charts, as we saw, they're the circle-shaped charts. Um, the slight size of the slice shows what portion of the whole. And that's what they're good for showing is a portion of the whole amount, not necessarily exact amounts. Typically, they're labeled with percents rather than frequencies. So you can see here the biggest slice is the largest percent or the largest portion of the whole amount. This is showing the same data as the Pareto chart up here. Frequency polygon, this one we haven't constructed. It's basically taking your, um, your bar graph and turning it into a line graph. It uses a line instead of bars to show the frequency of the midpoints of, and this is for numerical data, so it'd be data like the histogram. So the midpoint of each bar just connects that midpoint with a line instead of having bars going up to it. So it is very, very similar to the histogram. Um, and it does show a little bit of variation in the frequency from, from one value to another. So here you could see that the highest value is in the t around 22 and it tapers back off. This could very easily have been a histogram. Well, not exactly sure what the heights would be, but with bars that looked something like that. And the nice thing about a frequency polygon is it allows us to compare two different things. Because you notice we're looking at percents here. Here we're using the raw frequency, but if we use the relative frequency, we can compare, compare the percents from two different populations, and we can see how they line up. Now, both of these, um, the commute time seems to be relatively, the, the largest amount of commute time is at the 20 to 25 range. Um, but in Los Angeles, there t seems to be more longer commutes. In Boise, there seems to be more shorter commutes. So graphs that deceive. The biggest strategy that is used to create a graph that can be psychologically deceiving to the viewer is to not start the, the vertical axis at zero, to start it at a higher number and not clearly mark it that it's cut off. So for example here, we are looking at recovery rates or nausea experiences for patients using Oxycontin and those taking a placebo. This graph on the left or on the right here starts at zero and we can see that eh, it's a little more than twice as many, <coughs> excuse me, of the patients using Oxycontin experience nausea compared to the placebo. But this graph over here Instead of starting at zero, it starts at 10%. Well, because the placebo is just over 10%, you can see that looks like it's almost nothing. Then Oxycontin looks like it's like seven or eight or more times as much as the placebo. And that's again, because we cut off, this bottom portion of the graph is, is cut off and missing. So all we're seeing is this top portion that highlights the difference between the size of the two bars. So by not starting at zero and not clearly marking it, we've made it deceiving. 
Now, there are times where we have bars that are all very, very tall. Um, if we have a set of data where we have, you know, bars like this, they're all really tall, it might make sense to let's focus in on that top part of the graph. But if we do that when we make the graph, oops, I'm going to, so that we can focus in on that, it's important that we, oops, I want this one to be short. So here, because they were so close, it was really tough to see the difference over here by starting at something other than zero. Let's say this starts at 20 or whatever um, percent. We highlight that difference between them, but we need to clearly mark the graph by putting a cut on the axis and also putting some sort of like a cut slash across the whole graph. So it's very clear when you see this across the graph that oh, we've cut off part of the graph so that we can focus on the differences between them. Even then, it's, there's still that human brain's tendency to want to perceive them based on their raw height. So even then, it's still better if you can highlight the differences somehow in this graph to use the full version of the data. The cutoff graph or the non-zero axis is just eliminating a portion of the data and leading your mind to view it different. So pictographs. Pictographs are almost always, well, statistically, they're a really bad way of displaying data. Put it that way. Almost always something in a pictograph that could lead your brain to see the data other than what it actually is. Pictographs are very common in magazine articles and advertisements. Specifically for that reason is they can be used to mislead rather easily. So... One of the things that is done, you can, you know, you can use two, the fact that most pictures, most objects are two-dimensional, so it's changing things in two directions. And so even though it might be just doubled, it looks like it's four times as large because it's not just taller, it's wider. Or if you're using a three-dimensional effect, it might look like it's eight times the size, even though it's only double. For example, right here. So for the phone here, this really is just a bar that's that high. And this is just a bar that goes up to that high. You can see it's about three times as much. But by looking at the pictures of the phone, this looks like it's about 10 times the size because it's not just taller, it's also wider than what this picture was. So by putting in a two-dimensional object to display that, it's caused your, your again, the, the psychological effect on the mind sees it as being many times larger rather than just a few times larger. So some concluding thoughts. Um, when we deal with graphs, we not only have to be concerned about constructing the graph properly and displaying the data, but we also have to think about those things that could show up on the graph that make it deceiving. We've talked a little bit about use of color, uh, bright colors tend to, the brain seems to perceive them larger than others. For example, if I have a red box and a green box that are exactly the same size, put them side by side. The human brain oops, tends to perceive the red one as larger even though I traced them over the top, just red is one of those colors that the, the brain tends to perceive as larger than some other colors. So there's a lot of things we need to be careful of to make sure that those graphs present the data in an enlightening way rather than a deceiving way. So make sure for, for data sets that are 20 or fewer, maybe we want to use a table than a instead of a graph. Um, just because there isn't enough values to really divide it up to get an accurate view of the distribution. Um, graphing data, again, should be focusing on the nature of the data, not some sort of eye-catching, uh, fancy display. Make sure you don't distort the data by cutting out part of the axis or starting from a value other than zero. And make sure that it's, it's not has any sort of color or design element that's going to draw the attention of the brain, again, to 
incorrectly perceive the data. So that is section 2.3. We'll be back with section 2.4. So moving into section 2.4 of the text and the material, we're going to be looking more at paired data, or what we call bivariate data, where we're looking at one item or a sample where each item in that sample we're measuring two variables. Um, it might be height and weight or two things linked together like that. And so this is involving creating a scatter plot where we show one variable on the horizontal axis, one variable on the vertical axis, and then each dot represents two values within that. And of course, when you look at scatter plots and, and bivariate data or paired data like that, there's going to be talk about a correlation. Um, are the changes in one variable linked to the changes in the other variable, in other words? And then regression of how do we summarize this with some sort of an equation. So our key concepts, we're looking at paired data where we have one sample measuring two different variables about the sample. Um, we're going to be talking strictly about linear correlation or linear regression. Um, how close does the data come to fitting a line? Uh, a more advanced course might talk about other graphic shapes like an exponential curve, uh, parabolic or quadratic curve, and stuff like that. We're sticking strictly to linear relationships in this course. So correlation. A correlation exists between two variables if the changes in one variable are linked to the changes in the other variable. In other words, how strongly associated are those two values? And a linear correlation, of course, means that those variables, if we plot them on a graph, would fit relatively close to a line. The scatter plot, then, is the graph that is used to display those variables. So you can see here, we're looking at um, weighing seals with a camera. So taking a picture of a seal and comparing that to their weight. Um, looking at the overhead width, and then what their actual weight is. And you can see, so this one here is about 7.2 centimeters wide. Looks like a weight of like 115 kilograms. This one is 7.4 centimeters wide. Looks like a weight of a little over 150 kilograms. And so each of these dots represents two variables. This dot here, trace it down. That looks to be about 9.8 centimeters. Trace it over. A little bit more than 240, 245 kilograms. Or we can have a lot more. Here's the height of presidents and the heights of their main opponents. Um, so this was the president, the winner. This dot for this dot right here. Let's do this one right here. That president looks like they were 173 centimeters tall. Their opponent was about 168 centimeters tall. Again, each dot shows two different um, values. So this dot here, if I trace that down, that looks to be about 178 centimeters. Trace it over. Their opponent was about 196 uh, centimeters tall. Again, those are approximate because on a graph we don't necessarily get exact numbers. Now, if we wanted the exact numbers, we'd have to refer back to the table that was used to create this plot. Now, if we want to create this plot in Excel, here I have a set of data. I'm going to highlight both columns. So what this is, is this talking about time studied for a test, and then the score that was received on the test. So this first student studied, each line here represents a student. This first student studied for one and a half hours and scored 76% on the test. This student studied for four hours and scored 92% on the test. So I'm going to highlight the whole table, and I'm going to go insert. And I'm going to find scatter plot right here. Now I've got to make sure this did pick it up right. It did pick it up correctly. It put the time on the bottom and the score on the left. Sometimes it'll try to plot it as two separate sets of data. You have to be careful. Um, that appearance would look something like this, especially if you select line plot by accident like this. So that one actually did it pretty well as well. Here, let's do this. If I do it without putting those in there. 
there you can see the issue. So when I didn't select the, the labels on top, now it gives me, it graphs uh, the time studied as one line and the score on the test is another. That's not how we wanted this done. So make sure we highlight the, the headings and we insert, we'll go back to our scatter plot and there's our dots. Um, again, each dot here represents two values. This dot right here is representing a student who studied for three hours, and their score was right around 80 on the test. It looks like probably an 81, because that dot's just above the line. So it's that simple to create that scatter plot in Excel once you've entered the data table. Now, correlation. So linear correlation coefficient, we use the value R, which is actually a Pearson's correlation coefficient. This textbook does not use that term Pearson's correlation coefficient because it's, it is simply the most common one used. There are a couple other ones out there used. This one is about 97% of relationships, correlation coefficients are the Pearson's correlation coefficient. And so it describes how closely the two variables are related. In other words, how much of the changes in the second variable can be totally predicted by the changes in the first variable. So the value for R is always between negative 1 and positive 1. So negative 1 to positive 1. Of course, 0 being in the middle. Things that are close to 0 have no relationship. So there's no correlation here. As we get closer to negative 1, we have a strong correlation. But it's a strong negative correlation, meaning as one value gets larger, the other value has to get smaller. Close to positive one, we have a strong correlation as well. But that's a strong positive correlation. And by positive correlation, it means as one value gets larger, the other value also gets larger. And then, of course, in between, we have the gray area. This could be a medium correlation, weak correlation. Um, where those cutoffs are depend on the number of data values we are. If we only have three data points in the histogram or in the scatter plot, like here with only a few data points in this one, it's pretty easy for them to fall pretty close to a straight line. So we would expect with only six points there that we would have a pretty good correlation coefficient. Clo this is... The line is going upward, so it's a positive slope, so we'd expect that to have a correlation close to a positive 1. Here, well, there, there's a lot more points, so it's harder to have a good correlation, but there is no trend here. They're kind of scattered all over the place. There really is no correlation between the height of the president and the height of their opponent. doesn't even really show that the, the winner is typically the, the taller person or anything like that. So to show correlation, and as an example here, we got the length of a shoe print to the height of a person. Um, this is something that's used in police investigation and forensics a lot. So here we took a random sample of crime scenes where we found a shoe print. And then when we actually caught the person, what their actual height was. And you can see there, for the most part, there is a linear trend upward, except for this one point doesn't seem to fit. Um, we could go extend our analysis. Is that, is that point an outlier where that person just had really big feet and was short? Or maybe they wore large shoes just to be deceiving, um, which is something that, that has occurred. Um, wear really large shoes so it makes it look like it's a tall person committing the crime when it really isn't. Uh, we need to figure out what that point is because that point doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of it. Now, being only five data points, it's real easy for the other four to form a line. So it's hard for us to say that one doesn't fit because it's just as easy to say that maybe the line should go right here. And this is the data point that doesn't fit. So with a few data points, it's really hard to establish a, a good correlation. You have to be either really close to positive one or really close to negative one. 
for it to be considered a strong correlation. This class doesn't talk about using the number of data points um, to establish what is a weak and strong and moderate correlation. It uses the Excel functions. So we could use Excel to find a correlation. Um, let's go to Excel here and do this. So for these data points, it was equals correlation. So array one, here's my first set of points. Once I highlight those, I put in a comma, and then it goes to array two. I highlight these points. I'll close my parentheses and hit enter. It gives me a 0.84. So what that is saying is we have a 0.84 correlation. So looking at this continuum, we're somewhere up in here, close to positive one. But we don't necessarily know, is that a really strong correlation or a really weak or a moderate correlation for this number? Of so even though it isn't part of this course, I'm going to just pull up online here. I pulled up a table for what's considered the critical values of the Pearson correlation coefficient. And see, this is n minus 2 over here, the number of data points that we have. In this set, I've got... One, two, three, four, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve data points. So n equals twelve. So back here we go to twelve. Well, even at ten, um, it looks like we consider anything over. I would go down to a point oh five at least level significance. Anything over a point five seven six to be a significant correlation coefficient. So the fact that this came out to a 0.84, I would say this is showing a pretty strong correlation. There is at least a significant relationship. If this correlation was below that um, 0.576, if it was smaller than that, then we would say that we can't really use correlation to describe a relationship here, that there isn't a strong enough relationship that we can continue. So one of the things we'll do later in the course is we'll talk about linear regression. If that correlation is too small, we can't do a regression analysis because it's meaningless at that point. So that is using the correlation command in Excel to get that correlation coefficient. Now there's other ways we're going to do that as well. And there's a multiple output we can do. Now p-value um, is another way that we can use Excel to evaluate how strong the correlation is. It is the probability of getting a paired sample data with a at least that strong correlation coefficient. So the smaller the p-value is, the more significant the correlation coefficient is. We usually shoot for around uh, 5 to 10 percent, so 0 0.05 or 0 0.10. So like here, this is an output for a set of data where we had a p-value of 0.2936. Well, that's pretty high p-value. It's not small enough. If it were below a 0.10, we might start to think this was significant. This is saying that this is not a strong enough correlation for us to have, have much of a, an effect. Notice up here it says sample size of n is only 5. Well, only 5 data points, we would expect it to have a much higher correlation because it's easier for 5 data points to fall close to a line. Um, in Excel, we can do something similar to this. I can use going to my data analysis again, going to my regression tool. I'm going to clear all this out so that we can enter it. Oops. So my Y input range. Now it says the Y variable first. So that is the second variable. That would be my test scores. Then the X input range, so I'm going to highlight the X values, that is the hour study. I didn't highlight the labels, so I don't need to check that. I'm going to have an output. Um, I'm going to change this here. So I'm going to have an output down here. I don't want to talk about residuals or anything yet. We'll talk more about linear regression and residuals and all that stuff coming up in Chapter 10 later in the semester. So for right now, we get that output, and we can see here we have the multiple R. That is our, our correlation. That's what we had up here, 0.841228. 
R squared, we'll talk about that again. We'll talk about that more when we talk about actual linear regression later in the semester. This is giving us our p-value, or our significance here, um, 0 0.0006. Um, that's a pretty low p-value. So that's telling us that this is definitely a significant relationship. So we can get similar output from Excel. We'll look at getting the equation. This is the equation coefficients here. We'll look at getting those in a little bit. So interpreting the p-value, so here because the p-value was 29.4%, um, that's a pretty high, high percentage. Um, so this is not a small enough p-value. It's not a, so the p-value is saying a 29% chance that this could have just happened by random variation. That's too high of a chance for us to say there's a significant relationship. We want that possibility of random variation to be very small so that we can conclude it's significant. So a small p-value, 0.5 or less, sometimes 0.10 or less, um, is required for us to conclude that there's that significant relationship. So this is just another display. I believe this is the Excel stat display, which we're not using for this class. So we'll skip past that. So regression gives us an equation, a linear equation. Now remember, in a linear equation, there's two pieces. So y equals, there's the number that multiplies x, which is called the slope. That tells us how steep or shallow the line is or whether it goes up or down or, or whatever. Then this value that's by itself is the y-intercept. That tells us where does this start. When x equals 0, where, what is the value of y on that graph? So if you remember from your basic algebra, that is the shape of the line on the graph. So here, if I extend this line down, this point right here is the y-intercept. That would be that b0 value. And then how steep this line is, remember slope is a rise over run. Um, this one has a, a larger run than it does a rise. So this would be a very small slope here on this line. This one's giving an example equation here. It's saying that the y-intercept then is 80.9. You can see that's, that's not this, this data set. That's a different data set. Um, if this is what it gives for the, the output, this is the y-intercept. So that would be saying that it hit the y-axis at about 80.9. And that line sloping of 3.22 means it rises 3.22 units for every one unit of run. Now, the scale on the axis can be different, so it's the numerical values that we have to look at. Back to Excel here, if I want to find that regression equation using this, I can create this scatter plot first, and I point to one of the dots, and I right-click on one of the dots, and I select Add Trend Line. I want it to be linear, so I make sure it's linear, and as I scroll down, I want this to automatic. I don't want to put any forced... Uh, things in here. I don't want to set the y-intercept or anything like that. But to see the equation, I click display the equation and let's display r squared. So notice now that on my graph, I get this little text box here. That is saying my regression equation is y equals 9.3285x plus 60.625. So what that's saying is if I extended that line down, I didn't extend that very straight, did I? If I extend this line down, it hits here at just over 60, like 60.762 is where that hits that axis. And the slope is, again, the scale, this is only going, you know, on this scale, this is a 1. On this scale, this is 20. It's saying I rise 9.3 units approximately for every 1 unit that I run. So an extra hour of studying, we would expect on average to increase your test score by about 9.3%. So that's what this all means. Now the R squared of 0 0.7077 is not a correlation. You can see we're expecting 0.844. But if I take that, that says R squared, remember the correlation is R. 
So if I find on the calculator, do second square root of 0 0.7077, we get 0 0.8412, which was our R value we had. So that R squared value is literally the, the correlation coefficient squared. That is called the coefficient of determination, and we will discuss that again more when we come back to chapter 10. So that is our correlation and uh, regression stuff for bivariate data and scatter plots. Just a quick look. At this point, we're not expecting you to do a whole lot with finding the equations and interpreting them. And we will discuss this a lot more coming up later in the course. So with that, that ends our material for week two. And we'll be back later with our material for week three.